everybody. Now that summer is here and everyone is looking for dishes that are light and easy to prepare, I have some really good ideas for you. Eating complex carbohydrates instead of meat, incorporating more fruits and vegetables into your diet, and trying to consume less fat and calories are what, what we call light eating is all about. And believe it or not, restaurant chefs are just as conscious as the rest of us when it comes to what they eat. Uh, so I asked a few of my favorite chefs to come on and share one of their favorite light dishes with you. But before we get to their dishes, I have one of my own, and it comes from one of my uh, favorite cookbooks, Martha Stewart's Healthy Quick Cook, and it's a recipe for golden papaya and crab salad. And it's really easy to make. Um, it requires one pound of really, really good lump crab meat. And uh, this is in season all summer long. Uh, it is delicious, large chunks. Uh, you have to just pick through it just a little bit with clean fingers. Make sure your fingers are very clean. Just feel if you feel any little pieces of shell. Generally, the pickers are really good and uh, they don't leave any shells in your crab. I love this. Up in Maine, we get beautiful peaky toe crab. Uh, this is um, looks like a blue crab from the Chesapeake with nice big pieces. You can also get um, wonderful gulf crab, but uh, you want big chunks, very important. Another thing that we're going to add are uh, sugar snap peas that have been cut into three or four pieces. Make sure you have unblemished, really nice green sugar snaps and um, a small pot of boiling water. This takes, oh, just a couple seconds to blanch until these are bright green and tender. I'd say maybe 30, 45 seconds at the most in boiling salted water. Just let those cook and then immediately immerse them into, uh, I put a colander uh, or a strainer into a bowl of iced water. Um, and you just let them chill up. We have some already chilled here uh, and dried. Add those to your crab meat. Add a half of a small red onion, very finely chopped. This adds not only color, but also a nice zesty taste. And then lightly toss with a rubber scraper. You don't want to mush big, because you have those big, beautiful pieces of crab. Don't mush. And now make a dressing. I'm going to put a tiny bit of salt on this just to have it. Now. The dressing is two tablespoons of olive oil, a quarter of a cup of fresh lime juice, really a nice tasting dressing, uh, a quarter of a cup of flat leaf parsley, the Italian kind of parsley that's very finely chopped and it should be very fresh. Now this might seem like a lot to you, but it really goes very well. This is a half a teaspoon of red pepper flakes. It adds again a little bit of zest to this dressing and to the salad. Um, a teaspoon of granular sugar, a tablespoon of water, two dashes of Tabasco, one, two, even with that red pepper, this is a different taste than red pepper flakes. They're harsh, this is kind of smooth. And capers, I love capers. If they come in a very, very salty brine or packed in salt, make sure you rinse them. Uh, generally though, capers are packed in a vinegar um, and you can just drain them and add them to your dressing. And um, freshly ground black pepper. Again, a tiny bit of salt because we have the capers and we have, we've already salted the salad itself. And you see, this is not a thick dressing, but it is a very tasty dressing. So just stir that in. Oh, before I add it, because I don't want this to get soggy, I want to dress it just at the last. I want to show you how to make sure that your uh, papaya is perfect for the little dish. Each one of these is going to hold the crab salad on the plate. And to keep them from rolling around, just cut off a little bit of the peeled bottom of the papaya. Now that will stay nice and flat in your dish. Don't throw that away, eat it, it's really good. Same if you're going to stuff a tomato, cut the little bottom off, just so it has that nice flat area on which to um, sit. See, it will, will not go rolling off the plate as you carry it to your guests. Uh, to prepare a papaya, uh, you can peel it first, but uh, I will cut this in half first. And a papaya is filled with these odd little black seeds. Um, 
some people eat these. I think they're delicious, but um, they'll add a lot of roughage to your diet. Uh, perfect, but uh, don't serve them to your, to your guests. Um, they, a lot of people don't understand eating the papaya seeds. They think that they should be sort of discarded. But add this to your compost heap. All vegetable matter in the summertime, too, when you're using so many great fresh vegetables and fruits, should be um, added right to your compost. And uh, there, or if you have chickens like I do, all of this goes right to the chickens. They love papaya seeds. And so do the canaries. So here we just, and then with a vegetable peeler, just carefully peel the papaya, getting all that skin off. You can use a knife, but I find that a knife will sometimes just take off too much of the skin. And then remember, cut off the bottom so you have a nice flat surface. Now it's time to dress our salad. Tossing very lightly. Oh, what a beautiful dressing that is. Just toss. It is very flavorful. So in the summertime, always be looking to lighten your meals by uh, fresh ingredients, the freshest. Visit the marketplace uh, quite often so that, and a green market so that you can buy what's fresh, what's beautiful that day. And um, this is just an example of the kind of thing that I would like to sit down to on a hot summer night. Doesn't this look fabulous? A little bit falls on the plate, it's okay. You can just even rest this in a little bit. If this is gonna be for two, add a little bit more to the plate. You can have a little bit of a salad green too or watercress or something. You can do it that way or more formally just inside um, a little wedge of lime on the side of the plate is good, one or two. And there you have it. And next, we have a chef from one of Chicago's best loved restaurants. Uh, Rick Bayless, and he's going to share a salad recipe using one of my favorite vegetables, beets. Coming up, Chef Sue Torres spices things up in the kitchen with a recipe for one of the most popular dishes on her menu, seafood tacos with Yucatan salsa. Don't go away. back if you've never tasted jicama chef rick bayless of chicago's frontera grill and topola bampo restaurants suggests that you give it a try and i do too it's uh, available all year round it's low in calories high in potassium and it keeps in the refrigerator for up to three weeks what's more not only is it delicious with just a splash of lime and a bit of salt it's also very delicious incorporated into a salad. It's crunchy and delicious. Well, take a look at his light and easy recipe for jicama, beet, and orange salad. Hi, I'm Rick Bayless. And I have a recipe for a salad that uses an ingredient you may not be familiar with. It's called jicama. It's sort of slightly sweet, a little porous. It's got a texture that's a little bit like an apple, but unlike other root vegetables, jicama is rarely cooked makes an ideal thing to put into a salad, which is what I'm gonna be making today, blending it with roasted beets and orange. So we're gonna start now with the beets. Now the first thing that you have to do is to boil the beets. Now they just go into salted water and after about 30 minutes or so, they'll be completely tender. I've got some that are already cut up and we're gonna make this salad using beets that are kind of cut into what we would call baton shape. So I just slice the beet crosswise like that into about quarter inch slices and then cut those slices into the long batons here. Get those last little bits done there. And we're gonna scoop those all into a bowl here and go on to make the dressing next. Now, the dressing is based on citrus because we're going to blend some oranges into this. And what I'm going to do is to combine a little fresh lime juice in a bowl with a little orange juice to add sweetness because orange and beets are just a, a match made in heaven. To that, I'm going to add a little bit of orange zest. And using one of these little microplane graters, I can get off just that really beautifully aromatic zest from the orange, the part that's gonna give us that intense orange flavor. Okay, so we've got that 
in there. And now for the oil to go into this dressing, I'm gonna use peanut oil, but not just the regular peanut oil that you can find in the grocery store. This one is unrefined peanut oil, and it's got such a strong peanut-like flavor. And you'll see why in a second. I'm, I'm gonna work some peanuts into this dish. So we're gonna add that in there, along with just a touch of sugar. That helps with bringing out that sweet orange flavor and about a half a teaspoon of salt. That Whisk all of that together. Pour that onto the beets, and then you let that sit for about an hour or so for that delicious flavor to blend its way into all of those beets there. Okay, so the next step is going to be the orange part. I'm going to cut the exterior off of this orange. If you've never seen this style of peeling an orange, it can be very useful when you're trying to just get the little segments out here. So I'm going, I cut the top and bottom off and then cutting around the shape of the orange like that. I'm getting all the white pith off. I wanna get all of that off. And then the, the orange skin as well. Now once you've done that, ready to take all of the peels to the side and to this bowl that already has a couple of oranges cut into segments, I'm gonna segment this one as well. Now the idea here is to go around the orange, cutting between the little white pithy segments here. And once you've gone all the way around that, you'll have these beautiful little orange segments. Now the orange segments, we're going to combine with the marinated beets. I've got some that have already marinated for an hour down here. And that next step is to work that jicama into little batons as well that are the same size as the beets. Okay, so we've got the jicama with its tough exterior here, and you peel it, but I don't usually peel it with a vegetable peeler. Instead, I'll use a knife, a paring knife, to go around because I want to go about an eighth of an inch down. The exterior of this is sort of barky looking, but right underneath that you'll find a kind of fibrous layer. So get rid of that, and then I'm going to cut the jicama into slices just the way that we cut those beets in and then cut that crosswise also into those little strips, those little batons. And then all of that will get mixed in to the beet mixture. I think we're gonna probably need to put a little bit more salt into this mixture. And then just start tossing the whole thing together very refreshing and very beautiful. Now the last little fill up on this is those peanuts. So I'm gonna take our marinated beet salad with crunchy jicama and orange, pile that into a platter here. And you know one of the fun things is when you find this salad in Mexico, it's oftentimes garnished with not only peanuts sprinkled over the top of it, but for a festive touch, maybe even little colored candies, and almost always with little strips of sugar cane. Look at that beautiful aromatic salad because of the orange in that unrefined peanut oil. So we've got that on there. I've got some little strips of sugar cane that we're gonna just put on the top. Now you know how you eat the sugar cane, don't you? It's not something that you chew up and swallow, but instead you chew it just to get all of that delicious sugar cane sweetness out of it, but you're gonna be left with a fibrous texture in your mouth, which you discard. Okay, so we've got the sugar cane on there, a few peanuts. I like to serve this with a little arugula or other kind of lettuce, but arugula is kind of lovely and spicy. So I like to 
serve that around the outside of it that guests can help themselves with. Mixing it into that lovely peanut oil and orange dressing. And you've got an absolutely beautiful, very, very refreshing salad that I'll say is good for any time of the year. Not only is Rick's salad light, but it looks incredibly refreshing too, don't you think? Well, that is just what we're looking for at this time of year. Thank you, Rick. And when we return, Chef Sue Torres cooks up a really flavorful taco recipe that you'll want to add to your repertoire. Don't go away. Coming up on the show, Martha takes cooking questions from our live studio audience and shares more ideas for eating light. You won't want to miss it. traditional in Mexico, but here in Manhattan, Chef Sue Torres puts her own twist on them, making them one of the most popular items on her menu. Take a look at how you can make tacos out of tortillas at home. Hi, I'm Sue Torres of Sueños Restaurant in Chelsea. It's a Mexican restaurant, and today we're going to be making coconut guajillo poached seafood tacos. We're going to start out with our Yucatan salsa. These are some chopped tomatoes. We take the seeds out and we have minced red onions. The Yucatan is the region in Mexico in which they use a lot of fresh chilies. They're, they're known for using habanero chilies, which is why we're using here. This is a minced habanero chili, and they are really packing a lot of heat. This is for sure the spiciest of all of the fresh chilies. We're gonna mix this up and squeeze some fresh lime juice. Now I want to roll the citrus on my board to draw out the liquid and squeeze the whole lime in there. If the limes are dry, definitely add two. You know, you want to get about three or four tablespoons of the lime juice. So keep that in mind. And what it's going to do is it's actually the acid in the lime juice is going to cook the onions a little bit and turn the color of the onions and make it bleed so it, it's like a nice purple color which will look really good. I like to let it sit and make it a head. This is something you could probably refrigerate overnight or you can also make it that day. It doesn't really matter but it kind of absorbs more of the flavor of the chili and the citrus when you let it let it sit. And if you don't like spicy chili, you can cut it down. Instead of using a whole habanero, you can use a half of an habanero. That's fine as well. And salt and pepper is to taste. We're gonna mix this up and let it sit. You can either cover it and refrigerate it for uh, up to 24 hours, and it'll, it'll last for about three or four days in your refrigerator. It's great not only to put on these seafood tacos, but just to add as a garnish to many other things that you might be making at home, even if it's just a simple salad. You could put this on top of a simple salad. It'll really zest it up. Okay. So next we're going to make the poaching liquid with our guajillo chili. Now, guajillo chili, if you aren't familiar, this is a dried red chili. It's mildly spicy, probably one of the most widely used chilies in Mexico. And it has um, a fruity tart flavor to it with a little bit of heat. You always want to um, toast your chilies. You can either do it in the oven or you can do it on the um, right over a saute pan on an open flame. And be really cautious of the seeds. See, I just got the seeds in that saute pan. If you cook the seeds up, you're bound to, to choke yourself from the, um, the heat of the seeds. So you want to be really careful with that. And um, we always toast them while they're whole they'll start to like kind of pop up just a little bit and then you know that they're ready. It doesn't take long at all. We have our toasted, already toasted here. And I'm gonna pull out the seeds. If you wanted to, I guess if you want a little more heat to it, you could leave the seeds in. That's completely up to you. All depends on the level of spice you like. And we have some really hot water here. You could just bring water to a boil 
and then simmer it down and pour it over the guajillo chilies. Cover it with a little bit of plastic and let it sit aside until the, torti the um, chilies are nice and soft like this. You see how you can kind of break it up with your hands right here. And I use the liquid, the water that um, we cooked our chilies with, well, not cooking them, but sort of steaming them, and use all of that liquid for putting it in the blender to make a puree of this guajillo. You can add just a little dash of salt, and we're going to puree this up. Now, over a medium saucepan, you're going to pour the liquid and chili into a pan, and we're going to create our poaching liquid. So we have our coconut milk here. Let's get that all in there. This is one can. It's an 11 ounce can of coconut milk. This is the zest of one orange. The acid in this is really nice with the coconut and also with the tartness of the, of the um, chili. One garlic clove, one bay leaf, and about a half of a serrano, but if you don't mind it spicy, you can add more. You're just gonna slice it with the seeds and all. And put that in there. And a little bit of sugar. It's two tablespoons of sugar and a little bit of salt. And you want to bring this liquid to a boil and then reduce it down. And we have our ready poaching liquid here. So it kind of gets concentrated. You've got a lot of flavors going on there. The chili adds a nice tartness to it. And the coconut milk is kind of creamy and balancing. And the seafood, you could use whatever variety of seafood you like or whatever you enjoy eating. But what I have here is some salmon, some tuna, some striped bass, and uh, red snapper. But feel free to, you know, use whatever you'd like. And we're going to pour that into the reduced liquid, poaching liquid. And you're just going to let it simmer for like five minutes over a medium heat until the seafood is cooked. And for presenting, we have some warm tortillas. These are just handmade corn tortillas. You can get the store board as well. So you got some corn tortillas. And in this pot, we have our already poached seafood that we're just going to pile right on there. And the colors on this is nice because we're going to put the Yucatan salsa over the top and a slice of avocado. Now I slice the avocado in half and then I'm going to take the back of my knife and hit the pit to get the avocado out. And I can slice right onto the skin. The lime is just sort of like a garnish, so your guests can just sort of squeeze it right over. And the Yucatan salsa goes over the top. So you've got a nice variety of sort of like sweet, chili, pungent. And here we have our coconut poached seafood taco with Yucatan salsa, sliced avocado, and lime wedge. Enjoy. Well, thanks very much, Sue. With a recipe like that, I bet you'll now think twice about going out for Mexican food. Coming up, I'll be taking questions from our audience. Don't go away. Coming up, one of New York's hottest chefs, Michael Schulson of Budokan, shares the secret to one of his signature dishes. We'll be right back. for Ask Martha, where the audience gets the opportunity to ask me anything they want, within reason, please. Please raise your hand if you do have a question. Okay, hi. Hi, Martha. 
My name is Christy Armitage, and I'm from Bloomfield Hills, Michigan. I was curious if you had a creative idea for grilling fruit this summer. Grilling fruit? Yes. Well, I like to grill all kinds of fruit, so, uh, and I do. I love peaches grilled, and serve that with like a grilled pork chop. It's really good, and don't peel the peach, just uh, cut it in half, and uh, put it on the grill with a little bit of olive oil, and you can even sprinkle it with uh, some cayenne pepper, and it tastes really, really good. Um, I grill citrus slices. Well, I like grilled uh, grapefruit slices, and I love grilled pineapple. Mm. Did you ever do that? Yes, I yeah, love grilled with pineapple. lime and cayenne. It's it's very tasty. Mm -hmm. Those are just some of the things I'll do. Thank you. Sounds good. Hello. Hi, Martha. Uh, my name is Louisa De Silva. I'm here from Montreal, Canada. You're welcome. And I was wondering if you have a quick recipe for uh, a marinade that you can use for both grilled chicken and fish. Uh, well, yeah, I like uh, to use fruit juices, and I think it really does bring out the best in the, is it like a swordfish steak or a tuna steak? I use orange juice or grapefruit juice, a little bit of olive oil, um, a little bit of lemon juice, uh, salt, pepper, and a flavoring, uh, depending on what it is. If it's for chicken, I'll use maybe fresh thyme or um, parsley. Uh, if it's for fish, I'll use something like uh, maybe uh, crushed sage, very finely crushed sage, maybe a little bit of garlic. Mm -hmm. And uh, just marinate that um, chicken for up to maybe three hours and fish for an hour or so. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Hi, Martha. I'm Teresa Hughes from Waterford, Michigan. Mm -hmm. What's the best way to grill corn on the cob? Oh, there's so many ways to cook corn. Um, my favorite way to grill it is to boil it in the husk first, just for about maybe four minutes, the, in, in the entire husk. Okay. And then pull back the leaves and pull out the silk. Mm -hmm. So you don't have any silk because you don't want to eat the silk because it gets in your teeth and it's a pain in the neck. Uh, and then I brush the corn. I don't, take, I don't take all the husk off, though. I leave that attached to the stalk of the corn. And then I brush the corn with melted butter, cayenne pepper, salt, and black pepper, okay. and then I tie it back up again, okay. and then I grill that on the grill until, oh, maybe for 10 minutes, churning it all the time on a hot okay. grill. And then when you peel it back, it is so delicious. Oh, and of course, that's young corn. Uh, it should be picked that day, and uh, don't wait for 24 hours to cook it. It has to be picked that day, so you have to find somebody who's just picked it or pick your own, and uh, that's when I grill corn. Thank you. Very good. Hello. Hi, Martha. My name's Diane Newcomb. I'm from Lexington, Kentucky. Hi. And I like to bake with strawberries. Oh, yeah. But I, I always have some left over. And do I, is it best to store it in the fridge or on the counter? And do you have a suggestion of what I can do with my leftover strawberries? Oh, well, strawberries should be added to a fruit salad. Uh, I always store them in the fridge. Once, once they've been picked, they start to get soft really fast on your counter. Uh, and then the little flies come and, you know, they're not very appetizing. And they, they just spoil so fast if they're dead ripe. And that's when you should be eating them, when they're really ripe, red through, and, uh, or red ripe through. Um, and um, so I would just add them um, or cook them up with a little bit of sugar to make, a, to make a strawberry syrup or a strawberry sauce and serve that over biscuits with whipped cream, like strawberry shortcake. That's good. I like, to, I like to mix cooked strawberries with the fresh strawberries on my strawberry shortcakes. Sound good? Yes, it sounds okay. great. <laughs> well, thank you very much for your good questions. And up next, Chef Michael Schulson from Budokan, one of our favorite New York chefs, shares a vegetable dumpling recipe with us. It's his favorite. Don't miss it. Coming up later in the show, Seattle Bay chef Tom Douglas makes one of his classic seafood recipes, sake steamed salmon. You won't want to miss it. This next recipe for steamed vegetable dumplings comes courtesy of chef Michael Schulson, who specializes in delicious modern Asian cuisine. And for the dumpling filling, Michael purees edamame. Um, and most of you know what edamame is now. It's a wonderful Japanese word for soybeans. And soybeans look like this, sometimes 
two beans inside, sometimes three. When you open them up, these have been already steamed and they're served cold with salt and as an appetizer. And these are the beans themselves. They are a great source of fiber. Take a look at how Michael changes these from this to soft and tender dumplings. Hi, I'm Michael Schulzen, executive chef of Budokan Manhattan. Today I'm gonna to tell you my secret to making my signature dish edamame dumplings. So let's get started. First, I have edamame here, real simple, taken out of the shell, okay? What I do is I just drop it in boiling water and that's what I have here. So this has been cooking for about uh, 10 minutes here. And what it is, it's nice and soft. And what I'm gonna do is put it in the blender and we're gonna puree these up. Okay, so we're just gonna put these in there. We're gonna add a little bit of salt. We're gonna add some heavy cream and some butter. And that's it. You could also add what I have here. My secret in the dish at Budokan is a little bit of truffle oil put that in there as well. So what I do is take it, blend it up, okay? And what happens is it turns into a puree. And when a puree is hot, it's kind of liquidy. So another secret I have, put it in the refrigerator and let it set up. That's what I have here and it gets nice and thick. Over here, I have butternut squash. You could do this with any of your favorite vegetables. All you do is cut the skin off, roast it in the oven, season it. Five spice, star anise, cloves, whatever you want. Roast it for about 45 minutes, put it in the puree, and again, put it in the refrigerator and it gets nice and thick. So, now I'm on to the dumpling. Here I have a twin dragon dumpling wrapper. It's made with flour and water. You could also use different ones. This one has egg, it's a wonton wrapper. This is great for frying. You have this, it's an egg roll, traditional Chinatown egg roll. If you wanna put the puree in there, deep fry it, great. Or a spring roll wrapper, it's just gonna be a little bit lighter than the egg roll, so. What I do here is I take a little bit of the filling, put it right in the middle, okay? Clean my finger off. Then we're gonna put a little bit of water on the edge of the dumpling, okay? We're gonna fold it in half. See how simple that is? Okay. Now, if you want, you could just serve that shape. If you want, you could twist it around. You have a tortellini. If you want, you could make half moons just like that, you could dump them. If you want to make pot stickers where you pan sear them, just put them like that. So now onto the steamer basket. What I have here is the finished dumplings. You put them in here, you steam them till they're translucent. You can see, you can see the green there. These have been steaming for about four minutes till they're tender. And the edamame is already cooked, so you don't have to worry about overcooking it or undercooking it. So take a little bit of a broth here. And here I just have warm chicken broth. Put them in there. That's it, and I'm gonna garnish it with a little bit of onion sprouts here. And that's my famous edamame dumplings. Now that you know my secret, I expect you to go make it at home. Well, I can see why those dumplings are a signature dish. They look delicious, and because I've tasted them, they are delicious. Thank you very much, Michael. After the break, Chef Tom Douglas shares a recipe for salmon steamed in sake. Don't go away. Eating light is not just about the food you're eating, but also the way in which uh, you choose to cook it. Take my next guest chef, who is from the Pacific Northwest and loves to cook with salmon. Uh, not only is salmon an excellent choice when it comes to eating light, but steaming it requires no added fat, making it that much lighter. But chef uses something very delicious. He uses sake. Take a look. Hi, I'm Tom Douglas. Today I'm going to show you one of my favorite techniques and one of my favorite kitchen tools. Uh, we're going to make some sake steamed sockeye salmon. You know, in Seattle, uh, we have our choice of sockeye, pink salmon, king salmon, silver salmon. But today we're going to use this beautiful uh, sockeye salmon. Uh, it's a pretty simple recipe. Uh, I love this aromatic steam for a lot of reasons. Uh, it works with all kinds of fish and clams. and um, all, It's just a good technique to have in your repertoire. So sake, a little couple cups of sake the peel of an orange. This is where the aromatic comes in. Fresh ginger coins, and by that I just mean just 
chopped right across the grain and basically they're just going to release their essence and a couple of star anise pods. Uh, these are very fragrant. You don't need too many. Uh, it'll overwhelm the dish. So boom, just like that. And we are in the pot. We have our aromatic steam going. Uh, the last ingredient I put in is some lemongrass. And uh, pretty simple. Uh, I just take it and I bruise it. Just like that. And basically what that's going to do is, uh, again, add just another part of the steam bath going on there. Now for the salmon. Uh, a little technique when you're using, like I said, this is one of my favorite techniques uh, in the kitchen, but this tool, 10 bucks, are these steamers. And it's a really easy thing to find in Chinatown. Uh, but to get your salmon to just pop right off the steamer, I simply hit it with a little cooking spray. This one is Pam Organic, but uh, any spray will do. And just put your salmon right in, right onto the little bottom there. Uh, on with the lid and over our steam. Now to reinforce the sake flavor, and I do this sometimes when I'm uh, cooking with wine, I'll use it in a couple different areas to kind of reinforce the sake or the flavors that I'm trying to get to. Over here I have some uh, sauteed shallot and ginger in a little bit of butter. And now it's been reduced down with a little bit of, of sake. And then at the last minute, you want to add some cream. Uh, now this is, this is nice and warm here. I'm going to move these off to the side and bring this right over here. So we've got, this is the basis for our butter. And this is kind of a classic uh, French technique that I'm using with our Chinese steamer. Um, let's give that a stir. And right when that is warm, we want to add our butter. And we're going to add this in a couple of different stages because we don't want to chill it down too much. All right. For the second one, I'm just going to turn off the heat. We've got enough residual heat now to just add the rest of our butter. And it's important to keep stirring on a butter sauce. You just have to emulsify the butter that's there. That just melts down into basic lusciousness. OK. Now we've got the salmon, which has picked up the sake flavor. It's just literally been infused with the sake and the aromatics. Uh, we're going to take that with some, I guess I can just leave that plate there. I'm going to serve a little bit of white rice. And then there's our steam. You can see the steam coming off there. And if you want to be a professional chef, you just have to go like this. And then it makes you look really perfect. I'm going to use a spatula to get that. Oh, here's my good fish spat right there. And these just, because I, I put the nonstick spray on there, these just come right off. And sockeye salmon, they call it in Alaska, they call it red salmon because of its beautiful color. Okay. Now we're just going to finish with a little bit of our sake butter. Got the ginger in there. Beautiful garnishes for this would be a little, oh, I forgot my little lime juice. I want to put that in there too. And a little bit of sake just to, just to refresh the flavor. And we'll do another plate of that. A little more rice. A little salmon. And then right before I do the butter, I add my lime juice and my sake to refresh the flavors. And just bring it right on top. And here we go with a little lime garnish. Uh, any sort of butter sauce, good with a little citrus at the end. That acid just breaks up the butter. Uh, it is delicious. Served with sake, served with some Washington State wine. You know.
Well, you'll be pleasantly surprised when you taste the salmon. Steaming with sake is a good thing. Thanks very much, Mom. We'll be right back. Thank you to all the wonderful chefs who shared their favorite light recipes today. Thank you, audience, for being so great. And I hope you are all inspired to try some of these tasty dishes for your family and your friends. Tune in tomorrow for another great show filled with delicious recipes and tips for summer entertainment. We'll see you then.